Chip the glasses and crack the plates, blunt the knives and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles and burn the corks. Cut the cloth and tread on the fat. Pour the milk on the pantry floor. Leave the bones on the bedroom mat. Splash the wine on every door. Dump the crocks in a boiling bowl. Pound them up with a thumping pole. And when you've finished, if any, a hole, send them down the hall to roll. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates so carefully, carefully with the plate. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates so carefully, carefully with the plate. Far over the misty mountains, cold dungeons, deep and caverns old, we must away a break of day to seek the pale enchanted gold. The dwarves of yore made mighty spells while hammers fell like ringing bells in places deep where dark things sleep in hollow halls beneath the fells. For ancient king and elvish lord there are many a gleaming golden hoard they shaped and wrought and light they caught to hide in gems on hilt of sword. On silver necklaces they strung the flowering stars on crowns they hung the dragon fire in twisted wire they meshed the light of moon and sun. Far over the misty mountains, cold dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away our break of day to claim our long-forgotten gold. Goblets they carved there for themselves, and harps of gold, where no man delves, there lay they long, and many a song was sung unheard by men or elves. Roast Mutton there they all sat glum and wet and muttering, while Owen and Gloin went on trying to light the fire and quarrelling about it. Bilbo was sadly reflecting that adventures are not all pony rides in May sunshine, when Balin, who was always their lookout man, said, There's a light over there. There was a hill some way off with trees on it, pretty thick in parts. Out of the dark mass of the trees they could now see a light shining, a reddish, comfortable-looking light as it might be a fire or torches twinkling. When they had looked at it for some while, they fell to arguing. Some said no, and some said yes. Some said they could but go and see, and anything was better than little supper, less breakfast, and wet clothes all the night. Others said, these parts are none too well known, and are too near the mountain. Policemen never come so far, and the map makers have not reached this country yet. We have seldom even heard of the king round here. And the less inquisitive you are as you go along, the less trouble you're likely to find. Some said, after all, there are fourteen of us. Deep down here by the dark water lived old Gollum. I don't know where he came from, nor who or what he was. He was Gollum as dark as darkness, except for two big, round, pale eyes. He had a boat, and he rode about quite quietly on the lake, for lake it was, wide and deep and deadly cold. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make, not he. He was looking out of his pale, lamp-like eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers as quick as thinking. He liked meat, too. Goblin, he thought, good, when he could get it. But he took care they never found him out. He just throttled them from behind if ever they came down alone anywhere near the edge of the water while he was prowling about. They very seldom did, for they had a feeling that something unpleasant was lurking down there, down at the very roots of the mountain. They had come on the lake when they were tunnelling down long ago, and they found they could go no further. So there their road ended in that direction. And there was no reason to go that way, unless the great goblin sent them. Sometimes he took a fancy for fish from the lake, and sometimes neither goblin nor fish came back. Actually, Gollum lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. He was watching Bilbo now from the distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Bilbo could not see him, but he was wondering a lot about Bilbo for he could see that he was no goblin at all. Gollum got into his boat and shot off from the island while Bilbo was sitting on the brink, altogether flummoxed and at the end of his way in his wits. Suddenly up came Gollum and whispered and hissed, Bless us and splash us, my precious. I 
I guess it's a choice feast. At least the tasty morsel didn't make us grow. And when he said grow, he made a horrible swallowing noise in his throat. That is how he got his name, though he always called himself my precious. The hobbit jumped nearly out of his skin when the hiss came in his ears, and he suddenly saw the pale eyes sticking out at him. Who are you, he said, thrusting his dagger in front of him. What is he, my precious, whispered Gollum, who always spoke to himself, through never having anyone else to speak to. That is what he had come to find out, for he was not really very hungry at the moment, only curious. Otherwise, he would have grabbed first and whispered afterwards. I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins. I've lost the dwarves and I've lost the wizard and I don't know where I am. And I don't want to know if only I can get away. What's he got in his hands is, said Gollum, looking at the sword, which he did not quite like. The sword, a blade which came out of Gondolin. <laughs> said Gollum, and became quite polite. Perhaps she sits here and chats with it a bit, see, my precious. It likes riddles, perhaps, does it? Does it? He was anxious to appear friendly, at any rate for the moment, until he found out more about the sword and the hobbit, whether he was quite alone, really, whether he was good to eat, and whether Gollum was really hungry. Riddles were all he could think of. Asking them, sometimes guessing them, had been the only game he'd ever played with other funny creatures sitting in their holes in the long, long ago before the goblins came, and he was cut off from his friends far under the mountains. Very well, said Bilbo, who was anxious to agree, until he found out more about the creature, whether he was quite alone, whether he was fierce or hungry, and whether he was a friend of the goblins. You ask first, he said, because he had not had time to think of a riddle. So Gollum hissed, What has roots as nobody sees? He's taller than trees. Up, up it goes, and yet never grows. Easy, said Bill, the mountain, I suppose. Does it guess easy? It must have a competition with us, my precious. If precious asks and it doesn't answer, he eats it, my precious. If it asks us and we doesn't answer, then we does what it wants, eh? We shows it the way out, yes? All right, said Bilbo, not daring to disagree and nearly bursting his brain to think of riddles that could save him from being eaten. There are thirty white horses on a red hill. First they champ, then they stamp, then they stand still. That was all he could think of to ask. The idea of eating was rather on his mind. It was rather an old one, too, and Gollum knew the answer as well as you do. Chestnuts, chestnuts, he hissed. Teeth, teeth, my precious, but we is only six. Then he asked his second. Voiceless, it cries, wingless flutters, toothless bites, mouthless mutters. Half a moment, cried Bilbo, who was still thinking uncomfortably about eating. Fortunately, he had once heard something rather like this before, and getting his wits back, he thought of the answer. Wind, wind, of course, he said, and he was so pleased that he made one up on the spot. This lot puzzled the nasty little underground creature, he thought. An eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face. That eye is like to this eye, said the first eye, but in a low place, not in a high place. Said Gollum. He had been underground a long, long time, and was forgetting this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was getting impatient, Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages and ages before when he had lived with his grandmother in a hole in a bank by a river. My precious, he said, sun on the daisies it means it does. But these ordinary above-ground, everyday sort of riddles were tiring for him. Also, they reminded him of days when he had been less lonely and sneaky and nasty, and that put him out of temper. What is more, they made him hungry. So this time he tried something a bit more difficult and more unpleasant. It cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life, kills laughter. Unfortunately for Gollum, Bilbo had heard that sort of thing before, and the answer was all round him anyway. Dark, he said, 
without even scratching his head or putting on his thinking cap. A box without hinges, key or lid, yet golden treasure inside his head, he asked to gain time, until he could think of a really hard work. This he thought a dreadfully easy chestnut, though he had not asked it in the usual words, but he proved a nasty poser for Gollum. He hissed to himself, and still he did not answer. He whispered and spluttered. After some while, Bilbo became impatient. Well, what is it, he said. The answer's not a kettle boiling over, as you seem to think from the noise you're making. Give us a chance. Let it give us a chance, my precious. <sniffs> well, said Bilbo, after giving him a long chance. What is it? But suddenly Gollum remembered thieving from nests long ago. And sitting under the river, teaching his grandmother, teaching his grandmother to suck eggs as he is, eggs as it is. Then he asked, alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, ever drinking, all in mail, never clinking. He also, in his turn, thought this was a dreadfully easy one because he was always thinking of the answer. But he could not remember anything better at the moment. He was so flustered by the egg question. All the same, it was a poser for poor Bilbo, who never had anything to do with the water if he could help it. I imagine you know the answer, of course, or can guess it as easy as winking, since you are sitting comfortably at home and have not the danger of being eaten to disturb your thinking. Bilbo sat and cleared his throat once or twice, <clears throat> but no answer came. After a while, Gollum began to hiss with pleasure to himself. Is it nice, my precious? Is it juicy? Is it scrumptiously crunchable? He began to peer at Bilbo out of the darkness. Half a moment, said the hobbit, shivering. I gave you a good long chance just now. It must make haste, 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 said Gollum, beginning to climb out of his boat onto the shore to get at Bilbo. But when he put out his long, webby foot in the water, a fish jumped out in a fright and fell on Bilbo's toes. Oh, he said, it's cold, it's clammy. And so he guessed. Fish, fish, he cried, it's a fish. Gollum was dreadfully disappointed. But Bilbo asked another riddle as quick as ever he could, so that Gollum had to get back into his boat and think. No legs lay on one leg. Two legs sat near on three legs. Four legs got some. It was not really the right time for this riddle, but Bilbo was in a hurry. Gollum might have had some trouble guessing it if he'd asked it another time. As it was, talking of fish, no legs were not so very difficult. And after that, the rest was easy. Fish on a little table, man at table sitting on a stool, the cat has the bones. That, of course, is the answer, and Gollum soon gave it. Then he thought the time had come to ask something hard and horrible. This is what he said. This thing all things devours. Birds, beasts, trees, flowers. Gnaws iron, bites steel. Grinds hard stones to meal, slays king, ruins town, and beats high mountain down. Poor Bilbo. He sat in the dark thinking of all the horrible names of all the giants and ogres he had ever heard told of in tales, but not one of them had done all these things. He had a feeling that the answer was quite different and that he ought to know it, but he could not think of it. He began to get frightened, and that's bad for thinking. Gollum began to get out of his boat. He flapped into the water and paddled to the bank. Bilbo could see his eyes coming towards him. His tongue seemed to stick in his mouth. He wanted to shout out, Give me more time, give me time. But all that came out with a sudden squeal was, Time! Time! Bilbo was saved by pure luck. That, of course, was the answer. Gollum was disappointed once more. And now he was getting angry, and also tired of the game. It had made him very hungry indeed. This time he did not go back to the boat. He sat down in the dark by Bilbo. That made the hobbit most dreadfully uncomfortable and scattered his wits. It's got to ask us a question, my precious. Yes, yes, yes. Just one more question to guess. Yes, yes, said Gollum. But Bilbo simply could not think of any question with that nasty, wet, cold thing sitting next to him and pawing him and poking him. He scratched himself. He pinched himself. Still, he could not think of anything. Ask us! Ask us! said Gollum. 
And Bob pinched himself and slapped himself. He gripped on his little sword. He even felt in his pocket with his other hand. There he found the ring he had picked up in the passage and forgotten about. What have I got in my pocket, he said aloud. He was talking to himself. The golem thought it was a riddle and he was frightfully upset. Not fair, not fair, he is. It isn't fair, my precious. Is it? Not fair, is it? To ask us what he's got in his nasty little pockets is? Bilbo, seeing what had happened and having nothing better to ask, back to his question. What have I got in my pocket, he said louder. <laughs> his father. He must give us three guesses, is he, my precious? Three guesses, is Very well, guess away, said Bilbo. At it, said Gollum. Wrong, said Bilbo. But luckily he'd just taken his hand out again. Guess again. <laughs> said Gollum, more upset than ever. He thought of all the things he kept in his own pockets. Fishbones, goblin's teeth, wet shells, a bit of bat wing, sharp stone to sharpen his fangs on. Another nasty thing. He tried to think what other people kept in their pockets. Knife, he said at last. Wrong, said Bilbo, who had lost his some time ago. Last guess. Now Gollum was in a much worse state than when Bilbo had asked him the egg question. He hissed and spluttered and rocked himself backwards and forwards and slapped his feet on the floor and wriggled and squirmed, but still he did not dare to waste his last guess. Come on, said Bilbo, I'm waiting. He tried to sound bold and cheerful, but he did not feel at all sure how the game was going to end, whether Gollum guessed right or not. Time's up, he said. String or nothing, shrieked Gollum, which was not quite fair, working in two guesses at once. Both wrong, cried Bilbo, very much relieved. He jumped at once to his feet, put his back to the nearest wall, and held out his little sword. He knew, of course, that the riddle game was sacred and of immense antiquity, and even wicked creatures were afraid to cheat when they played at it. But he felt he could not trust this slimy thing to keep any promise at a pinch. Any excuse would do for him to slide out of it. And after all, that last question had not been a genuine riddle according to the ancient laws. But at any rate, Gollum did not at once attack him. He could see the sword in Bilbo's hand. He sat still, shivering and whispering. At last, Bilbo could wait no longer. Well, he said, what about your promise? I want to go. You must show me the way. Did we say so, precious? Show the nasty little baggins the way out? Yes, yes. But what has it got in its pockets, is eh? Not string, precious, but not nothing. Oh, no. <laughs> Never you mind, said Bilbo. A promise is a promise. Cross it is. Impatient, precious, his Gollum. But he must wait. Yes, it must. We can't go up the tunnel so hastily. We must go and get some things first, yes. Things to help us. Well, hurry up, said Bilbo, relieved to think of Gollum going away. He thought he was just making an excuse and did not need to come back. What was Gollum talking about? What useful thing could he keep out on the dark lake? But Bilbo was wrong. Gollum did mean to come back. He was angry now and hungry and he was a miserable, wicked creature, and already he had a plan. Not far away was his island, of which Bilbo knew nothing. And there, in his hiding place, he kept a few wretched oddments and one very beautiful thing, very beautiful, very wonderful. He had a ring, a golden ring, a precious ring. My birthday present, he whispered to himself, as he had often done in the endless dark days. That's what he wants now, yes, he wants it. He wanted it because it was a ring of power. And if you slipped that ring on your finger, you were invisible. Only in the full sunlight could you be seen, and then only by your shadow, and that would be shaky and faint. My birthday present. It came to me on my birthday, my precious. So he had always said to himself. But who knows how Gollum came by that present ages ago in the old days when such rings were still at large in the world. Perhaps even the master who ruled them could not have said. Gollum used to wear it at first till it tired him. And then he kept it in a pouch next to his skin till it galled him. And now usually he hid it in a hole in the rock on his island and was always going back to look at it. And still sometimes he put it on when he could not bear to be parted from it any longer or when he was very, very hungry and tired of fish. He 
and he would creep along dark passages looking for stray goblins. He might even venture into places where the torches were lit and made his eyes blink and smart, for he would be safe. Oh yes, quite safe. No one would see him, no one would notice him, till he had his fingers on their throat. Only a few hours ago he had worn it, and caught a small goblin imp. How it squeaked. He still had a bone or two left to gnaw, but he wanted something softer. Quite safe, yes, he whispered to himself. It won't see us, will it, my precious? No, it won't see us, and its nasty little sword will be useless, yes, quite. That is what was in his wicked little mind, as he slipped suddenly from Bilbo's side and flapped back to his boat and went off into the dark. Bilbo thought he'd heard the last of him. Still, he waited a while, for he had no idea how to find his way out alone. Suddenly he heard a screech. It sent a shiver down his back. Gollum was cursing and wailing away in the gloom, not very far off for the sound of it. He was on his island, scrabbling here and there, searching and seeking in vain. Where is it? Where is it? Bilbo heard him crying. Lost it is, my precious. Lost, lost. Curses and crashes, my precious, is lost. What's the matter, Bilbo called. What have you lost? It must ask us, sweet Gollum. Not his business. No, Gollum. Gollum is lost. Gollum, Gollum, Gollum. Well, so am I, cried Bilbo, and I want to get unlost. And I won the game, and you promised. So come along. Come and let me out, and then go on with your looking. Utterly miserable as Gollum sounded, Bilbo could not find much pity in his heart, and he had a feeling that anything Gollum wanted so much could hardly be something good. Come along, he shouted. No, not yet, precious, Gollum answered. We must search for it. It's lost, Gollum. But you never guessed my last question, and you promised, said Bilbo. Never guessed, said Gollum. Then suddenly, out of the gloom came a shout. What has it got in its pockets, is? Tell us that. It must tell fast. As far as Bilbo knew, there was no particular reason why he should not tell. Gollum's mind had jumped to a guess quicker than his. Naturally. For Gollum had brooded for ages on this one thing. He was always afraid of its being stolen. But Bilbo was annoyed at the delay. After all, he had won the game pretty fairly at a horrible risk. Answers were to be guessed, not given, he said. But it wasn't a fair question, said Gollum. Not a riddle, precious, no. Oh, well, if it's a matter of ordinary questions, Bilbo said, then I asked one first. What have you lost? Tell me that. What has it got in its pockets, is? The sound came hissing louder and sharper, and as he looked towards it, to his alarm, Bilbo now saw two small points of light peering at him. As suspicion grew in Gollum's mind, the light of his eyes burned like a pale flame. What have you lost, Bilbo persisted. But now the light in Gollum's eyes had become a green fire and was coming swiftly nearer. Gollum was in his boat again, paddling wildly back to the dark shore. And such a rage of loss and suspicion was in his heart that no sword had any more terror for him. Bilbo could not guess what had maddened the wretched creature, but he saw that all was up, and the Gollum meant to murder him at any rate. Just in time, he turned and ran blindly back up the passage down which he had come, keeping close to the wall and feeling it with his left hand. What has it got in its pocket, sis? He heard the hiss loud behind him, and the splash as Gollum leapt from his boat. What have I, I wonder, he said to himself, as he panted and stumbled along. He put his left hand in his pocket. The ring felt very cold as it quietly slipped onto his groping forefinger. The hiss was close behind him. He turned now and saw Gollum's eyes like small green lamps coming up the slope. Terrified, he tried to run faster, but suddenly he struck his toes on a snag in the floor and fell flat with his little sword under him. In a moment, Gollum was on him. But before Bilbo could do anything, recover his breath, pick himself up, or wave his sword, Gollum passed by, taking no notice of him, cursing and whispering as he ran. What could it mean? Gollum could see in the dark. Bilbo could see the light of his pale eyes, shining even from behind. 
Painfully he got up and sheathed his sword, which was now glowing faintly again. Then very cautiously he followed. There seemed nothing else to do. There was no good crawling back down to Gollum's water. Perhaps if he followed him, Gollum might lead him to some way of escape without meaning to. Curse it! Curse it! Curse it! hissed Gollum. Curse the baggins! It's gone! What has it got in its pockets? Is all we guess, we guess, my precious. He's found it. He must have, yes. My birthday present. Luba pricked up his ears. He was at last beginning to guess himself. He hurried a little, getting as close as he dared behind Gollum, who was still going quickly, not looking back, but turning his head from side to side, as Bilbo could see from the faint glimmer on the walls. My birthday present! Curse it! How did we lose it, my precious? Yes, that's it. When we came this way last, when we twisted that nasty young squeaker, that's it. Curse it! It slipped from us. After all these ages and ages, it's gone. Oh. Suddenly Gollum sat down and began to weep, a whistling and gurgling sound horrible to listen to. Bilbo halted and flattened himself against the tunnel wall. After a while, Gollum stopped weeping and began to talk. He seemed to be having an argument with himself. It's no good going back there to search, no. We doesn't remember all the places we visited. And it's no use. The Baggins has got it in his pockets. The nasty noser has found it, he says. We guess it is precious, only guesses. We can't know till we find the nasty creature and squeeze it. But it doesn't know what the present can do, does it? It'll just keep it in its pockets. Is. It doesn't know, and it can't go far. It's lost itself, the nasty nosy thing. It doesn't know the way out, it said so. It said so, yes, but it's tricksy. It doesn't say what it means. It won't say what it's got in its pockets. Is. It knows. It knows a way in. It must know a way out, yes. It's off to the back door. To the back door, that's it. The goblinses will catch it then. He can't get out that way, precious. Oh, goblinses! Yes. But if it's got the present, our precious present, then goblinses will get it. Oh. They'll find it. They'll find out what it does. We shan't ever be safe again. Never one. Oh. One of the goblinses will put it on, and then no one will see him. He'll be there, but not see him. Not even our clever eyes will notice him. He'll come creepsy and tricksy and catch us. Oh, oh. Then let's stop talking, precious, and make haste. If the Baggins has gone that way, we must go quick and see. Go. Not far now. Make haste. With a spring, Gollum got up and started shambling off at a great pace. Bilbo hurried after him, still cautiously though his chief fear now was of tripping on another snag and falling with a noise. His head was in a whirl of hope and wonder. It seemed the ring he had was a magic ring. It made you invisible. He had heard of such things, of course, in old tales, but it was hard to believe that he really had found one by accident. Still, there it was. Gollum with his bright eyes had passed him by only a yard to one side. On they went, Gollum flip-flapping ahead, hissing and cursing. Bilbo behind, going as softly as a hobbit can. Soon they came to places where, as Bilbo had noticed on the way down, side passages opened this way and that. Gollum began at once to count them. One left, yes. One right, yes. Two right, yes, yes. Two left, yes, yes. So on and on. As the count grew, he slowed down, and he began to get shaky and weepy. But he was leaving the water further and further behind, and he was getting afraid. Goblins might be about, and he had lost his ring. At last he stopped by a low opening on their left as they went up. Seven right, yes. Six left, yes, he whispered. This is it. This is the way to the back door. Yes, here's the passage. He peered in and shrank back. But we dursn't go in, precious. No, we dursn't. Goblins is down there. Lots of goblins is. We smell them. What shall we do? Crush them and crush them. We must wait here, precious. Wait a bit and see. 
so they came to a dead stop. Gollum had brought Bilbo to the way out after all, but Bilbo could not get in. There was Gollum sitting humped up right in the opening, and his eyes gleamed cold in his head as he swayed it from side to side between his knees. Bilbo crept away from the wall more quietly than a mouse, but Gollum stiffened at once and sniffed, and his eyes went green. He hissed softly but menacingly. He could not see the hobbit, but now he was on the alert and he had other senses that the darkness had sharpened, hearing and smell. He seemed to be crouched right down with his flat hands played on the floor and his head thrust out, nose almost to the stone. Though he was only a black shadow in the gleam of his own eyes, Bilbo could see or feel that he was tense as a bowstring, gathered for a spring. Bilbo almost stopped breathing and went stiff himself. He was desperate. He must get away out of his horrible darkness while he had any strength left. He must fight. He must stab the foul thing, put its eyes out, kill it. It meant to kill him? No, not a fair fight. He was invisible now. Gollum had no sword. Gollum had not actually threatened to kill him or tried to yet. And he was miserable, alone, lost. A sudden understanding, a pity mixed with horror, welled up in Bilbo's heart. A glimpse of endless, unmarked days without light or hope of betterment. Hard as stone, cold fish sneaking and whispering. All these thoughts passed in a flash of a second. He trembled. And then quite suddenly, in another flash, as if lifted by a new strength and resolve, he left. No great leap for a man, but a leap in the dark. Straight over Gollum's head he jumped, seven feet forward and three in the air. Indeed, had he known it, he only just missed cracking his skull on the low arch of the passage. Gollum threw himself backwards and grabbed as the hobbit flew over him. But too late, his hands snapped on thin air, and Bilbo, falling fair on his sturdy feet, sped off down the new tunnel. He did not turn to see what Gollum was doing. There was a hissing and cursing almost at his heels at first. Then it stopped. All at once there came a blood-curdling shriek, filled with hatred and despair. Gollum was defeated. He dared go no further. He had lost, lost his prey, and lost, too, the only thing he had ever cared for, his precious. The cry brought Bilbo's heart to his mouth, but still he held on. Now faint as an echo, but menacing, the voice came behind. Thief! 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 Baggins, we hate it! We hate it! We hate it forever! <laughs>